In today's presentation, first I'm going to talk about a calendar of events that may be helpful to people that you know who didn't come here today. I'm going to talk about some of the forms that are on your tables. Don't worry about them just yet. And then we'll get into the meat of the matter, information, um, legal information about benefits that are available to help you recover. In addition, keep an eye on your local media. Uh, you might write down Lone Star Legal Aid. We have a Facebook page and we will be posting additional legal clinics to our Facebook page as um, they become confirmed. I did a presentation at North Harrison and I had to keep saying if we get a FEMA declaration, when we get a FEMA declaration, because there's a, a process that has to be gone through um, as soon as there's a disaster of any type, inspectors and damage assessments have to be made. And it's a multi-step process. Once a city reaches their damage threshold, then they can go to the county and say, we need a declaration. When the county reaches its threshold, it can go to the state and say, we want a declaration. And then the final step is when the state has met its threshold, a request goes to the president for a federal disaster declaration. And the FEMA declaration is significant, as you'll hear throughout this presentation, because it makes a whole panoply of federal benefits available that wouldn't otherwise be available. So you need to know these important facts. This disaster is disaster number DR4269. I underlined the nine for a particular reason. We already had a disaster working a little bit east of here, and that was DR4266. So that means only seven and eight occurred somewhere else in the country before we got our next disaster. Why does it matter? When you apply for FEMA benefits, you have to be very clear which disaster you're applying for help for. And it is actually possible to have more than one application for different disasters going on at the same time. The incident period is April 17th to April 24th, the day before the worst of the flooding till yesterday, uh, Sunday. You had to have suffered your loss or your damage during that period of time in order to be eligible for FEMA assistance. In addition, the four counties that you see listed above, Fayette County, Grimes County, Harris County, and Parker County, right now are the only counties included in DR4269. That doesn't mean that Montgomery County, Chambers County, Galveston County won't later be included. What it means is right now the total damage assessment for those counties doesn't yet meet the threshold. So as damage estimators get out there and more information comes in, additional counties may be added. To register for FEMA, we have lots of ways that you can do it. www.disasterassistance.gov. And if it's too long to remember that, just do fema.gov. Because there's a link there uh, that's very easy to navigate that will get you to where you need to be. You can call FEMA at 1-800-621-FEMA. For individuals who have a speech disability or hearing loss and use TTY, there's a separate telephone number. And for folks who use 711 or a video relay service, there's an additional telephone number. So they've made it about as easy as they possibly can. You can also go to disaster recovery centers and register in person. But if you go to FEMA.gov or disasterassistance.gov, you will be able to search for open disaster recovery centers. The toll-free telephone numbers will operate from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. seven days a week until further notice. So really, online and by phone are by far the easiest ways to register for FEMA. All right, let's talk for a minute about some of the pieces of paper that you have on the tables in front of you because this is really important so that we can provide you the best service possible 
here at Lone Star Legal Aid. The first is called a preliminary application. This gives us enough basic information about you. For me to do an individual consultation with you, we can get in touch with you from my office and one of our advocates will call you and we'll see what we can do to help. So that's very important. In addition, because we are partially federally funded, we are the fourth largest nonprofit legal organization in the country. And when I say our services are free, I mean you don't pay us a dime. I don't mean if you get something we get a percentage. That's called a contingent fee. We don't do that. If you are eligible for Lone Star Legal Aid to help you, it's free. <laughs> no dollars, okay? But because a large percentage of our money comes from the federal government, okay, well, we have this thing called compliance. We have federal regulations that we have to comply with. And a, one of them is that individuals have to either be US, U.S. citizens, that's this form right here. If you're a U.S. citizen, please, 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 please sign it. Please sign it. If you are not a U.S. citizen, there's a long list of individuals who are still eligible for our assistance, and that's this long two-page form called Verification of Eligible Alien Documentation. And don't worry, I will work with you or my assistant will work with you to find out where you fit on this page. The idea is we have to ring one of these bells is how I think of it, okay? So I wanna make sure that you have that. What is available out there to help you? Let's talk about that. First, I already mentioned the Disaster Relief Fund set up by the Lone Star College Foundation and you should be sure if you have a need apply for that assistance. It started out as a $50,000 fund. I sit on the board for the foundation because I'm the chair of the board for the college. So I know that initially it was $50,000 and we all said yes that's great that's wonderful use a facsimile signature push those checks out as fast as you can but hey, guess what? Especially over in the Greenspoint area, some of our students lost their cars. They lost their computers. How are they gonna get to class? And if they get to class, how are they gonna complete their assignments without a computer? So I don't know how far $50,000 is gonna go. I want you to know, I want the Lone Star College family to know that somebody on that foundation board, an anonymous donor, then donated $250,000 so that that fund would be $300,000 to help our students and help our employees. That's how much we care about your success. So that's your first step. If there is anyone here who was receiving SNAP benefits, commonly referred to as food stamps, and that food was lost or ruined in the flood. You can have that replaced. You can get those benefits back. The deadline is 10 days from the flood, not 10 days from the FEMA declaration. So how do you request replacement of those benefits? You fill out this form. This is an affidavit that goes into Health and Human Services. It's called an affidavit, but it doesn't need to be notarized. You are signing under penalty of law, blah, 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 okay? Now, even though, so even though as legal aid lawyers, we interpret the law to say, this is all you have to send in to get those food stamps back, we know from past experience that sometimes people are told, Oh, but you didn't make a report of lost food. Well, what do you think this was? This kind of looks like a report of lost food to me, but they don't always get that. So we created this thing instead. It's just a very simple note. It says I lost some food in the flood and I need my benefits back. A lot of our students are renters. If you lived in the Greenspoint area and you were in an apartment, and you are on the first floor, you don't have an apartment anymore. Because in that particular area, 
estimates are up to 15,000 apartment units in that one concentrated area. Most of those families are low income, and the Houston Fire Department said every first floor apartment flooded. Every single one. That's 7,500 units. So you have a couple of choices, and you want to think about them fairly quickly. If you want to return to where you were after it's repaired, we are advising you to fill out this tenant's request for repairs. It sounds silly. You're probably used to the idea if your dishwasher breaks, you have to go tell them that you want them to come fix the dishwasher because they don't know your dishwasher is broken, but they know your apartment was flooded, right? So why do you need to do anything? You need to do this to protect your rights in case the landlord decides to close the unit. That's the term that's used when a landlord decides to take a rented unit off the market. Okay? If the landlord closes the unit before you have evidenced a desire to return, because keep in mind, you have a lease. And usually the lease operates to the landlord's benefit. You have to pay or you get evicted, blah, blah, blah. Well, here's a circumstance where that lease benefits you. If the landlord tries to close the unit and take it off the market before the end of your lease term and you have requested these repairs, the landlord has to give you back all of your security deposit, your prepaid rent, and may have to pay your moving costs. So if you are not sure, turn this in. We have the forms, okay? So that's very, very important. If you are on federally federally subsidized housing, Section 8, project-based, any of those things, and you don't want to stay where you are, you need to go to the housing authority and ask for a move voucher. You have to show them good cause, and of course a flooded out apartment is probably good cause. You don't lose your place on the waiting list. You're not on the waiting list. You're already a tenant. And, and I had a student ask this question yesterday. If I move out, don't I go to the bottom of the waiting list? No. But if you ask for a move voucher, you have a limited amount of time to find another place that will accept the voucher. So that's something to think about. So let's say you've decided you don't want to stay there and you're not on subsidized housing. You're what we call private rental. You can break the lease. Technically, you're not breaking it, you're canceling it. If the entire unit is not habitable, does that mean there has to be mud to the ceiling in all the rooms? No, absolutely not. If you had a few inches of water, but it went throughout the unit, think about the effects of mold, okay? So if the unit is completely uninhabitable, you can tell the landlord, I'm out of here. And the landlord has to give you all of your security deposit back plus the prepaid rent. So you would be entitled to rent from April 18th to April 30th because you've already paid for the month of April. So that's an option that you have available. You have to give the landlord notice uh, there's not a required period, but you have to put it in writing that that's what you want to do. We've talked about food. We've talked a little bit about renter's rights, but you don't have any place to stay yet, right? Okay, I've talked about dealing with your landlord, but now what? Let's talk about FEMA. I already had the document up showing how to access FEMA benefits. That's your first step. You must register with FEMA. Let me say it again, you must register with FEMA. There is no harm to registering with FEMA and finding out later you're not eligible for anything. But if you don't ask, you don't get. They're not gonna come looking for you to give you checks. You're gonna have to register. If you are a homeowner, 
and you are living in a floodplain and you don't have flood insurance, you might have some problems with FEMA. If you live in a floodplain, you don't have flood insurance, and FEMA has never helped you before because of a flood, then that won't be a bar to getting assistance now. Kind of the rule is, if you choose to live in a floodplain, it's pretty, the land's cheap, you can get a good price. FEMA's gonna help you one time. After that, if you have a subsequent flooding event and you didn't have flood insurance, FEMA is not gonna help you. And it's important to be aware of that. FEMA is what we call a program of last resort. If you have insurance, you must file insurance claims. Whether it's car insurance, renter's insurance, homeowner's insurance, you must file with your insurance. FEMA is here to help you if you don't have insurance. If your insurance is not adequate to address all of the damages, or if your insurance company de denies the claim for some reason. So be sure and file a claim if you have one. All right, let's dig into the weeds now about FEMA. We have our FEMA declaration, so these benefits are available for people who are eligible for them. The FEMA assistance limit is $32,500. Okay, if you've lost your whole house and you have no insurance, that doesn't sound like a lot of money. If you were driving a Lexus and you didn't have it fully insured, that's not a lot of money. On the other hand, it's free money. These are grants. You don't have to pay it back. Of course, being federal benefits, it comes with some responsibilities for the people who receive it. Keep your receipts. Keep your receipts, keep your receipts. If you have receipts like cash register receipts or restaurant receipts on that kind of funny paper that fades after a while, make hard copies. Because you will need legible, you may need legible copies in the future. Why? Because when FEMA sends you some money, they're gonna tell you what it's for. They're gonna say, this is for temporary housing. That means you get to spend it on a hotel or another apartment. Or they're gonna say this is to replace lost possessions. Go buy whatever you want to with it. If you can't show though that you use the money for the intended purpose, they may ask for it back later. And that request to repay it may not show up for three years. So that's why keep the receipts, make them hard copy receipts, save them. Get yourself a big brown envelope and with a big marker, write FEMA and just throw those receipts in there so you can find them later. And if you have another flood within the next three years, take that envelope with you when you leave, okay? Because that'll be a real problem. When you call FEMA to register, notice I said when, I didn't say if. When you call FEMA to register, you will need to provide the following information. Your name, your address. Hmm, which address? The address where you are, the address where you are, some other address. They're going to need the damaged address. And if you are not going to continue receiving your mail at the damaged address, you need to make sure they have the address where you are going to get mail, where you are going to check mail, and where you're going to open the mail. Now this might seem obvious, but I cannot tell you how many appeals we've had to do because somebody didn't open their mail and they missed a deadline, okay? Very important. So make sure they know where they can find you. You're gonna need to give them your social security number. We already talked about insurance, file with any insurance you have. All right, let's talk about what you can get and how from FEMA housing needs. The individual assistance program, which is what has been activated on this declaration, can provide assistance 
for homeowners for up to three months because you've got it takes time to repair your house so you can move back into it so we're talking about hotel another apartment something like that now if you have homeowners insurance you probably have displacement coverage the question is what was your deductible and how much replacement coverage do you have so even though you have a homeowner's insurance policy you still want to register for FEMA because they still may be able to help fill that gap for renters FEMA can provide uh, temporary housing assistance for up to 30 days I don't want you to assume that's the end of it it depends on the local circumstances and it depends on individual circumstances after Hurricane Ike in 2008 people were receiving temporary housing assistance for 18 months and that's because so much of the housing stock was wiped out there was no place for people to go so that's an example to get housing assistance all of the following have to be true listen carefully the loss had to have occurred had to have occurred in one of the counties declared as a da disaster that's obvious right you have to have filed for insurance if you have insurance we already talked about that somebody who lives in that household has to be a US citizen a national a naturalized citizen or a qualified alien so if you're not if you don't fit any of those categories but you have children who are US citizens that will work If your spouse is a US citizen that will work there ha you have to have a valid social security number and the place it was damaged this is going to sound kind of silly has to be the place where you usually live so let's say you have you're lucky you have your house and you have a rental house and it was the rental house that was damaged they're not going to help you with that not under the individuals and households program they may help you under a business program but not under this program because your primary residence is fine you have a vacation home you have a secondary home and that's what was damaged they're not going to help you with that so it has to be the place where you were living at the time of the disaster the place has to be not habitable or you can't get to it because of the disaster or it requires repairs because of the disaster that has to be true to be eligible for temporary housing assistance now here are the disqualifiers the things that will prevent you from getting temporary housing assistance you have other adequate rent-free housing available to you this is kind of the converse you have a rent home and it's okay and nobody's living in it right now you can go move into your rent home you have a secondary house a vacation home and it's empty and you can go there you can do that so they're not gonna help you with what went underwater does this make sense and by the way just because your friend your neighbor your sister said oh you can double up with us you can sleep on the couch we'll put up a cot in the whatever room no that doesn't count that doesn't count as other adequate it doesn't meet the adequate requirement you don't have to double up with somebody else so if that's your circumstance you want to get a hold of FEMA and get registered for housing assistance if you refused help from your insurance company anybody ever have a fender bender with your car and decide oh I, I don't want the insurance company to have a claim because they'll raise my rates if you don't make that claim FEMA's not going to help you and they will ask they'll ask for the letter from the insurance company let's talk about what we call other than housing needs these are the other kinds of things that either FEMA helps with directly or FEMA provides the entry point to these types of disaster recovery benefits again the loss has to have occurred in an area declared as a disaster you have to have filed for your insurance benefits there has to be someone in the household who's a citizen a naturalized citizen or a qualified alien you have to have accepted assistance from all other sources available to you and you have to be able to prove up your damages this is going to apply for everything 
How do you prove up your damages? Get that handy dandy photo out that you use, that camera that you use to take selfies. Well, now you're really going to put it to work. And if it's too late, if everything's already been pulled out of your apartment and it's out there on the lawn, go take pictures of the pile on the lawn. Heavens, I hope everybody over in Greens Point was burning up their cell phones because I drove through there last night and everything's gone. It doesn't look like a flood ever hit. So FEMA can provide grants for home repairs, replacement of essential household items. That word essential is very important. FEMA doesn't exist to put you back like you were before the flood. That's what insurance is for. Replacement cost insurance has to get you what we call whole. Lawyers talk about making somebody whole. That's not FEMA's job. FEMA is going to get you into a livable situation, get you back on your feet so you can get your life going again. So if you had great grandma's, I'll give you an example. My husband has a dining room table that his great or great great grandmother brought from Pennsylvania to Oklahoma in a covered wagon. Okay, it has a lot of sentimental value. And if we get flooded and that thing gets ruined, FEMA does not care. We're going to get some table at, you know, the, the furniture barn or whatever. So they're interested in you having a table, not that you have one equivalent to grandma's table that came in the covered wagon. So it's important to understand that. They will also provide grants to replace personal property. Think about medical equipment prescriptions, things like that. Those are high priority items. There are seven families in the area who will be eligible for funeral reimbursement because we did have seven storm related deaths last week. Transportation, here's an important one. And it ties into school rights that I'll talk about in a few minutes. You have a choice. If you've been displaced from your home, whether to enroll your children in the school near where you are now or keep taking them to the school where they were, well, that's going to cost time and money. It costs gas to schlep them back and forth. That is a disaster related expense. And I would suggest that you start a log of all the trips you make back and forth to that school because of that so that you can submit a request for reimbursement. Those are transportation reimbursements. If you're now having to ride the bus or something like that and you didn't have to do that before, consider keeping those receipts and including that in your reimbursement request. Some of you, instead of just getting a nice letter from FEMA with a great check, you're going to get a loan packet from the Small Business Administration. And if you don't fill that packet out and you don't send it back in, you're not going to get anything from FEMA. They don't care that you can't afford to make the payments. They don't care that your credit score is minus 20. Something in their computer said you should be able to pay back a small, an SBA loan. So you have to play the silly game. You have to fill out the application and send it in. If you don't, FEMA won't help you. So please do that. And the Small Business Administration loans are a little different. The amounts that you can get are higher. Well, guess what? Because you're going to be paying it back. <laughs> so the requirements are a little different. Under the other needs programs, FEMA can also help with crisis counseling. For income tax assistance in filing casualty losses. I don't know if any of you recall this, but after hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Ike, there were special time limited tax credits on your income tax if you suffered loss that wasn't reimbursed. I don't, can't say that we'll see, this, see that again, but you can get tax assistance. And then, of course, me, legal advice. I'm here under the auspices of disaster legal services, as are my colleagues who are going all over the area trying to help folks. 
Okay, so we talked about renter's rights. So the question for purposes of the recording is, if FEMA sends you a loan packet and you fill it out and you get the loan, but you really don't want the loan, <laughs> can you refuse it and then get FEMA? It's a real short answer, no. Okay, <laughs> the good news is the interest rate is low, the payout is long, and the idea is the monthly payments are intended to not be overly burdensome. But yeah, if they, off, if they find that you're eligible for the loan, you're gonna have to take it. Now, they might offer you more than you think you need, and you can ask for a lower loan amount. You can do that. But you can't then go to FEMA and say, well, I only took 10,000 from SBA, so I want 10,000 from you, that won't work. The Red Cross is also making financial assistance available. There are some require damage requirements though. You had to have had at least 18 inches of water, mud, or sewage in your home. And it, I don't think the grants are very high, but it's not hard to get them. So you might wanna register with the Red Cross and apply for that assistance as well. That's just something else that's out there. Um, if you are in a mobile home and you suffered significant flooring damage or foundation damage, you might also be eligible to receive a little bit of help from the Red Cross. All right, let's talk about immigrants because I know we have folks here at the Lone Star College system literally from all over the world. Depending on someone's immigration status, they're probably eligible for at least some kind of help from FEMA. The immigrants that are gonna be eligible for as much as everybody else are those that are here with a documented legal status. Let me put it that way. I hate the term illegal alien, okay? <laughs> it just offends me and everybody else, I think, okay. <laughs> but that doesn't mean if you're undocumented that you can't get anything. There are still other forms of help that you are eligible for. Help finding lost people, transportation, emergency medical care and medicine, crisis counseling, emergency shelter, emergency food and water, and some disaster legal services. I think what's most important for immigrants to know with regard to FEMA is registering with FEMA and asking for help does not make you a public charge. If you're in the process of trying to get status or trying to become a citizen, you know that if you commit a crime, if you become a public charge, it'll disqualify you. This does not make you a public charge. You couldn't help that we got 20 inches of rain. So please don't let that be a barrier to registering with FEMA to get whatever help you can get. Home repair scams. If you own your home and you have, the first thing you're gonna see if you have trees and debris in your yard is the chainsaw guys are gonna start showing up. And they're gonna show up in a beat up pickup truck and they're gonna have a chainsaw and they're gonna quote you a low price and it'll be even lower if you'll pay them in cash to cut up your tree and your debris and haul it all away. Well, that's probably not too problematic because you can stand there and watch them while they cut up the tree. You know, you know they're getting the job done. Now, you might want to be a little concerned. What if they slip and cut off their own leg or something? Do you have liability insurance that's going to cover that problem? So watch out for that. A bigger problem is what we call storm chasers. And these are folks that go from disaster to disaster to disaster knowing that people are desperate. They will show up in a pickup truck, it'll have ladders and saws and tools and all kinds of stuff hanging off it, and they will offer to repair your house for you. And again, the price goes down if you pay them in cash. I want you to watch out for one thing in particular. What state is the license plate from? Because if it's not Texas, you're gonna have a hard time finding them later. That's number one. Check that license plate. Number two, if you do decide to go forward with somebody like this doing your repairs, 
write down some sort of an agreement, what he's going to do, how much you're going to pay. Don't pay all at once. Pay in percentages. I'll give you this much when this much of the work is done. And some is always held back and not paid until you're satisfied that the job is complete. Okay? Hmm. He needs materials. He needs lumber and, you know, whatever, nails. Who's going to go to Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever and get the materials? This is important. If he says, I'm going to just add it on and I'll go get it, you don't need to worry about it, guess who owns those materials? He does. Maybe you gave him $500 up front so he could go buy the materials, but he buys it with his credit card. And he takes off and uses it wherever. All you have, and it's probably not a good claim, is a contract claim against him because he didn't perform the contract he agreed to perform. But it's his stuff. The better plan is you go to Lowe's, you go to Home Depot, you put it on your credit card, now you own those materials, and if he takes off with it, you're calling the police. You're calling the sheriff, and now it's theft. So that is something just really important. We see this happen after every single disaster. I call them storm chasers, so watch out. Next item up, replacing important documents. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine, some of you are probably experiencing this, if you lived in a first floor apartment in the Greens Point area, uh, you got out of there with what was in your pocket. Did that include your social security card, your driver's license, your insurance cards? How about your birth certificate, marriage certificate, divorce decree? All of that has to be replaced. It's time consuming and it's unpleasant. So the flyer that's back there is intended to help you out. Here's the website that you go to to replace your driver's license. Here's some information on how to replace your social security card. We already talked about replacing food stamps. If you lost your EBT card, contacting 211 or either of the numbers shown on the flyer will help you get a replacement EBT card. If you need to replace your debit card, you go to your bank, talk to your bank. Lost checks, talk to your bank. Credit cards, call the credit card company. This just goes on and on. And here's information about how to replace vital documents, birth, marriage, and death. Those are all kept at the Bureau of Vital Statistics. That's the easiest place to go. If you live in the county where all those events happen, you can go to the county clerk's office. But guess what? When you go to get those documents, somebody's going to ask you to prove you are who you say you are. But the reason you're doing this is because you lost everything. So how do you do that? At the very bottom there, number eight, are items, of, items that can, can be used to prove your identity. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't take my passport with me. If I had, that would work. An employer ID card. A lot of you are wearing your lan lanyards, that would work. A school ID card, marriage or divorce record, don't carry that with me. Military ID, adoption record, no, don't carry that with me. Life insurance policy, probably the last thing I'm going to think to take with me. Uh, but health insurance, I don't leave the house without my medical insurance card in case something happens because I don't want to fight the battle later. <laughs> with the hospital or doctor. So there's some information. After just about every disaster, we'll have somebody who's caught in a bureaucratic loop and can't replace some documents because they can't prove they are who, who they say they are or they can't prove they lived where they say they lived. So if you can get your hands on a bank statement, a utility bill, something like that that's recent, addressed to you that proves where you were living. So hang on to those items. 
Okay, school rights. Anybody in here have children, school-age children? Okay. There's almost always at least one every time I um, do these presentations, so let's talk about this. I touched on it a little bit a little while ago. Your children can go to school where they are staying now. They can be enrolled for up to 30 days with no documentation. That 30 days can be extended on a case-by-case -case basis depending on what the situation is. If you have a child that now is enrolled in a different school and they were on a 504 plan, an IEP, enrolled in special ed, they are entitled to those exact same accommodations at the new school. And if the school, new school doesn't like it, if the new school says we can't do that, you need to call us because they don't get that excuse. They just have to figure out how to make it happen. And by the way, I'll, ho I'll go ahead and scroll up on this one to make sure I point this out. On all of these flyers, this telephone number at the bottom is the statewide disaster legal assistance hotline. Legal assistance. We got a message on that line last Monday night and it was somebody who was scared and she needed to get out of her home and needed a place to stay, and I thought, uh, we're lawyers? <laughs> we're, we're not the rescue team, so this is for legal issues, all right? But you can call that number, or you can go on that website. That's our website, Lone Star Legal Aid. If you have any problems getting your children in school where you are, I've already said you can keep them in their old school, provided you can get them back and forth. Okay, We know that children recover from disasters faster the sooner we get them back in school. It provides um, some regular structure to their day. It provides uh, a normal routine. A lot of schools, for a lot of kids, they can get up to two meals a day that mom and dad don't have to worry about. And mom and dad get a little break, get an opportunity to do all the stuff they need to do to recover from the disaster. Insurance. If you have insurance that covers any of your damages in any way, file a claim. Under Texas law, insurance companies have a limited amount of time to process a claim, and they either have to pay the damages or tell you why they're not. And if they go beyond the time period, it's called, it's presumed to be insurance bad faith and you can get three times the damages plus attorney's fees if it ends up being proved to be insurance bad faith. Take photographs, submit photographs, submit affidavits, whatever you need to do to prove your damages and prove your case. The more information you provide up front, the less likely your insurance company will deny you, the less likely FEMA's gonna deny you, and the less chance that we're off into some sort of an appeal to get you the help that you need. So if you have insurance, you paid for it, use it, file a claim. If you have problems, let us know. Um, we don't typically take insurance claims except in limited circumstances because there are lots of lawyers out there who will. And as legal aid lawyers, that's just not what we do. Okay, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you so very much for being here. I hope all of you fully recover as soon as possible. Thank you.